A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 18th of May 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Now without any delay, let's straight away get into the article discussion. Now look at this article here. This article gives us some information about the global temperature. Yesterday, a new update about global temperature was issued by World Meteorological Organization. In that update, WMO has warned that 2023 to 2027 will be the warmest fire period ever recorded. This is because of the combined factors of greenhouse gases and El Nino. And this is the background of the article given here. Now in this discussion, we will learn the other data provided in the WMO's update. See the WMO in its update said that there is a 66% chance that annual global surface temperature will exceed 1.5 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial levels for at least one of the years between 2023 to 2027. This is shocking, right? As we all know, the main goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement is to limit the global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius above average levels measured between 1850s and 1900s. Further, the Paris Agreement aims to limit the global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius if possible. But if we look at the WMO's update, the WMO expects that global mean temperature will be at a range of 1.1 degree Celsius to 1.8 degree Celsius for each of the five years between 2023 to 2027. And in any of these years, there is a 66% chance that annual global surface temperature will exceed 1.5 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level. This ultimately defeats the Paris Agreement goal, right? And this is one information. Apart from this, the WMO says that there is a 98% chance that at least one of the next five years and the five year period as a whole will be the warmest on record. See, these are worrying factors. Now here we should think what are all the reasons for this temperature rise. For that also WMO said that El Nino and the greenhouse gas emissions are the two main factors for the rise in the global temperature. See El Nino is a climatic pattern that describes the unusual large scale warming of surface temperatures in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. The weather phenomenon normally occurs every 2 to 7 years. The El Nino impacts the weather systems around the globe by causing disruptions in temperature, rainfall and winds. Basically, El Nino event increases the global temperature in that particular year after it develops. See, it is expected that the year 2024 is going to witness El Nino. So, a warming El Nino is expected to develop in the coming months. Therefore, El Nino together with the human induced climate change is going to push the global temperatures in the upcoming years. And this will have impacts on health, food security, water management and the environment. Apart from this, the rising greenhouse gas emissions also contribute to the increase in the global temperature. So these are all the informations given in the WMO's update. See in conclusion, El Nino is a natural phenomenon. We don't have any say in that. But each country must adhere to the principles of the 2015 Paris Agreement and they should reduce their greenhouse gas emission significantly. If they do this, it will somewhat help us to prevent the increase of the global temperature. Now that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some points regarding the recent WMO's update and the reasons that led to the increase in global temperature. Now with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this editorial article here. In this article, the writer compares two recent judgments of the Supreme Court and how they are contradictory in nature. In this regard, we'll see about what are those two judgments and how they are in contradiction with one another. And finally, we'll see about the need to reclaim the accountability of government to the voters. 
But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See the two judgments mentioned in this article are about the control over civil services in New Delhi and the case regarding the split in the Shiva Sena party. Now let us look into them one by one briefly. First of all, we will see the Delhi case. See, even though New Delhi is a union territory, it has a legislative assembly. The demarcation of power between the elected government of New Delhi and the central government is mentioned in the article 239 AA of the Indian constitution. As we all know, there is a constant tussle going on between the elected government of Aam Admi Party and the lieutenant governor. In this regard, a question has been raised. See, civil services in New Delhi would be accountable to whom? To the Delhi cabinet or to the union government? This matter went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court opined that civil services will have to report to the Delhi cabinet only. See, Supreme Court came to this conclusion because in parliamentary democracy, government is accountable to people. It also said that there should be triple chain of command. Now, what is this triple chain of command? In this command, the civil service officers, they are accountable to the ministers. And the ministers, they are accountable to the legislature. And the legislature is ultimately accountable to the electorate, that is the voters. So, Supreme Court said that any disruption in this chain of command will be against the principle of parliamentary democracy. And because of this reason only, Supreme Court gave such a verdict. And this is about the Delhi case. Moving on, now we'll see about the Maharashtra judgment. See, first of all, you should know some background information about the issue in Maharashtra. See, the Shiva Sena party has been split into two factions, Udav Thakre group and the Eknath Shinde group. The party called for a meeting of legislatures on 25th June 2022. During this meeting, Eknath Shinte and 11 other MLAs were absent. So, the Deputy Speaker of Maharashtra issued notice to remove these MLAs from the Assembly. See, the MLAs against whom the charges were initiated, they approached the court. The court granted time for MLAs to respond to the notice. The Deputy Speaker also appointed Ajay Chaudhary as leader of Shiva Sena Legislature Party. And this was challenged by Shinde group by calling it unconstitutional and taken with bias. See, the plea also challenged the notice served on Shinde and his supporters for not attending the 25th June meeting. Meanwhile, the governor of Maharashtra asked Udav Thakre to prove his majority in a floor test on June 2022. For this, Udav Thakre approached the Supreme Court to set aside the floor test. But this plea was rejected by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court asked Udav Thakre to prove his majority. After this verdict by Supreme Court, Udav Thakre resigned. Eknath Shinde became the chief minister with the support of BJP. See, the Shinde group also issued its own resolution to remove Sunil Prabhu, who was the whip of the Shiva Sena party. And they appointed Bharat Gogwale in his place. The Speaker of the House also recognized this appointment and this is the background of the issue. See, this matter was taken to Supreme Court again. The Supreme Court in its verdict said that Speaker's decision of recognizing Gogwale as a whip of the party is illegal. The reason behind such verdict was that the Speaker has not verified if this appointment was the decision of the political party or not. The Supreme Court also stated that 10th Schedule of India makes a clear distinction between legislature party and the political party. See, here in these terms, we are familiar with the political party. But what is a legislative party? See, legislative party includes all MPs and MLAs of a particular political party. So, Supreme Court said that the power to issue directions lies with the political party only and not with the legislative party. This means that the legislatures have to obey the instructions given by the political party or else they will be disqualified under the anti-defection law. And this is all about the Maharashtra case. Since we have discussed enough about these two cases, now we'll see how they are contradictory in nature. See, the Supreme Court on Delhi case gave priority to the principle of parliamentary democracy. 
It said that legislatures are ultimately accountable to the people who elected them. But on the Maharashtra case, it said that the legislatures are accountable to the political party. The Supreme Court said that defying the directions of a political party will amount to disqualification under the anti-defection law. See, this particular judgment increases the hold of leader of a political party over the legislatures. See, the anti-defection law undermines the scope of legislators' accountability to the people who elected them. In that way, these both judgments are contradictory to each other. Now, you may have a question here. Why Supreme Court gave such contradictory judgments? See, it is because in Delhi case, the Supreme Court had the scope to interrupt the constitution. But in the case of Maharashtra, it went by the clear language of the 10th schedule. The 10th schedule focuses more on the political stability rather than the accountability of the legislatures to the people who elected them. And this is not in line with the representative form of democracy that is followed in our country. That is why the author wrote about these two issues and the need to reclaim the accountability of the legislatures to the people. Now we'll see what is the need to reclaim the accountability of the legislatures. See, in a parliamentary democracy, the ultimate authority lies with people. Here, the constitution envisages a chain of accountability. The government is responsible to the legislature and the legislators are responsible to their voters in every election. But the anti-defection law affects this accountability in a negative way. The anti-defection law makes the legislatures to work and vote as per the directions of their political parties even if it affects the people who elected them. The anti-defection law is framed on the perception that people vote for the political party rather than the candidates themselves. But this perception is wrong. That is exactly why the author is saying that there should be an accountability to the people who elects the legislatures to the legislature. So from this discussion, we can say that anti-defection law clearly violates the principle of parliamentary democracy, which is a part of the basic structure of the Indian constitution. So the author is asking the Supreme Court to examine whether the anti-defection law violates the basic structure to reclaim the accountability of government to the people or not. That's all about the discussion. In this discussion, we saw two judgments given by the Supreme Court and how it is contradictory with one another and the need for accountability of legislatures to the people. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, we are going to take up this discussion based on an advertisement that is published in the newspaper today. See, this ad is basically a shout out to Jammu and Kashmir as it will be hosting the G20 Tourism Working Group meeting this year. This ad also talks about the digital governance initiative of the government of Jammu and Kashmir. In this context, we should use this opportunity to learn about the important digital governance initiatives of the government of India and the benefits of each of these schemes. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Now, first of all, we'll talk about the Digital India Mission because it is an umbrella program that covers multiple projects of central government as well as the state government. See, the Digital India campaign was launched by Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Its vision is to transform India into a digitally empowered society and a knowledge-based economy. Therefore, the main goals are digital access, digital inclusion, digital empowerment and bridging the digital divide. This means making sure that every citizen has access to digital technologies and can benefit from them. In order to accomplish this, many initiatives were brought under this program. We'll see what they are. First is the CSC, which is expanded as Common Service Center Scheme. See, CSCs act as access points in villages. They provide electronic services to create a digitally and financially inclusive society. Basically, these centers offer a wide range of services at the affordable prices. They provide video, voice and data content. They cover areas like e-governance, education, health, 
telemedicine and entertainment. Know that they also assist with private services. One important aspect of CSEs is their web-enabled e-governance services in rural areas. They help with application forms, certificates and utility payments such as electricity, telephone and water bills. Moreover, CSEs provide various services like agriculture, education, health, rural banking, insurance and even commercial services like printing, internet browsing and village level BPO. And this is about the CSEs. Next in line, we have the Umang app. See, Umang app stands for Unified Mobile Application for New Age Governance. It is actually a mobile app that brings many government services on a single mobile app. The larger goal here is to make the government services accessible on the mobile phones. The services include Aadhaar, DigiLocker and Bharat Bill Payment System among the others. It also provides access to over 1200 services of various government organizations in state and at the center as well as utility payments. See, using the app, citizens can even access employees provident fund organization services. They can apply for a new PAN card and so on. Know that the app supports 13 Indian languages. Its user-friendly interface ensures easy navigation and seamless access to government services. And these are the services offered by Umang. You just go through it, okay? Next in line, we have the DigiLocker initiative. See, basically, DigiLocker is an electronic storage space. So, it allows individuals to keep their documents in a digital format. This makes them easily accessible and verifiable also. Users can store documents such as insurance, medical reports, school certificates and more. The locker is accessible through a mobile number. And the DigiLocker can also store a URI link of e-documents issued by various departments. This makes it a secure and convenient way to manage important documents. And then we have the UPI. See, UPI stands for Unified Payments Interface. We all know it is a mobile-based payment system in India. So, it allows the customers to make instant payments anytime using a virtual payment address they create. See, VPA is something that serves as a unique identifier. It basically replaces the need to share sensitive bank account details when making payments. This eliminates the risk of exposing bank account information to other people. And this is about the UPI. And next we have Covin app. See, Covin is a cloud-based IT platform designed for India's COVID-19 immunization program. It handles various important tasks such as registering beneficiaries, allocating vaccination centers, sending text messages to beneficiaries, and live monitoring of vaccine vials in the cold storage. Know that Ministry of Health and Family Welfare owns the Covin platform. One of the key features of Covin is its ability to monitor and track the vaccination drive in real time. This ensures that beneficiaries are accurately identified and proxy vaccinations are prevented. Apart from what we saw till now, we also have My Government Initiative. This is a platform designed to promote the participation of citizens in the governance process. It also aims at crowdsourcing the governance ideas from citizens. And then we have My Scheme. This is another platform launched in July 2022 to help citizens access eligibility-based services. And then we have Direct Benefit Transfer Platform. This enables other enabled direct benefit transfer for 315 schemes across the 53 ministries. Apart from these, there is this Diksha platform, which is a national level educational platform for students and teachers with over 7,633 courses. These are some of the e-governance initiatives taken by the government. Now we'll specifically see the digital initiatives taken by government for welfare of farmers. First, we have eNAM. See, it is an electronic trading platform for agricultural products. It connects the agricultural produce market committees across the states in India. The platform enables contactless remote bidding and mobile-based anytime payment. 
See, this means that traders hereafter no need to visit the mandis or banks to complete the transactions. This is about the ENAM. And then we have the Soil Health Card Scheme. See, it was introduced by Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. It provides farmers with a printed report. This report contains information on the nutrient status of their soil and recommendations for improving its fertility and health. See, the card include details such as pH, electrical conductivity, organic carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, zinc, boron, iron, manganese and copper. See, farmers receive the card every three years. This allows them to apply the recommended nutrient doses based on the soil test values for better soil health. See, the card is available in 21 languages and can be printed from the Soil Health Card portal. And this is about the Soil Health Card scheme. And finally, we'll see about the M4 Agri, which stands for Mobile Based Advisory System for Agriculture and Horticulture. As the name suggests, it is a mobile based advisory system for the agriculture and horticulture. It has been implemented in the northeast states, namely Tripura, Mizoram, Manipur, Meghalaya, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. See, these are some of the important digital governance initiatives of the government of India. Take note of all the points that we saw in this discussion. It will be very useful in your mains exam. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this article here. See, the Union Cabinet has approved an updated production-linked incentive scheme for IT hardware manufacturing in India. The total budget of the scheme has been more than doubled to 17,000 crore. And this shows that the government is trying to boost electronics manufacturing in the country. So, using this context, let us learn about the PLI scheme, that is the production-linked incentive scheme. See, the PLI scheme was introduced by Government of India and it is aimed at promoting domestic production and reducing the imports. It provides performance-linked incentives to the businesses. For what reason they are giving incentives? For increasing the sales of goods manufactured in India. See, the scheme aligns with Make in India initiative and it encourages both foreign and domestic companies to expand their production and exports. For example, let's consider the automobile industry. Under the PLI scheme, automobile manufacturers are offered incentives based on incremental sales. This means that if a company increases its sales compared to the previous year, it becomes eligible for the incentives. This encourages companies to produce more vehicles domestically. So, this will not only boost the employment opportunities but also reduce the country's reliance on imported automobiles. See, the eligibility criteria for availing the PLI scheme differs across sectors. To be eligible, companies must have a registered manufacturing unit in India. The minimum investment requirements also vary depending on the sector, such as Rs 10 crore for micro, small and medium enterprises and rupees 100 crore for others and approximately rupees 1000 crore for investment oriented companies. See, so far the government has announced PLI schemes for 14 sectors. The 14 sectors are mobile manufacturing, manufacturing of medical devices, automobiles and auto components, pharmaceuticals, drugs, specialty steel, telecom and networking products, electronic products, white goods such as ACs and LEDs, food products, textile products, solar PV modules, advanced chemistry cell battery and drones and drone components. See the scheme shall extend an incentive of 4% to 6% on incremental sales of goods manufactured in India and this incentive will be given for a period of 5 years. Now let me explain this with an example. Imagine there is a company called XY and it manufactures electronic devices like smartphones in India. Under the PLI scheme, XY would be eligible for incentives based on their incremental sales. Which means that there should be an increase in sales compared to a base year. Let us say in the base year, XY sold 1 lakh smartphones. Now in the following year, 
XY manages to sell 120,000 smartphones, then they would be eligible for the incentives on those incremental units sold, that is 20,000 smartphones. The incentives provided would be in the range of 4% to 6% of the value of those 20,000 additional smartphones. And this is about the PLI scheme. Now, before concluding our discussion, we'll see what is the significance of this scheme. Firstly, PLI scheme serves as a boost to domestic manufacturing. See, PLI scheme encourages companies to increase their production capacity. This contributes to reducing the country's reliance on imports and it strengthens the Make in India initiative. Secondly, it helps in creating employment opportunities. See, PLI scheme incentivizes companies to expand their manufacturing facilities. So, the scheme generates more job opportunities across various sectors. Thirdly, it will help in reducing import dependency. As I already said, the scheme encourages domestic companies to increase their production and compete globally. Therefore, it helps to decrease the need for importing goods from other countries. Fourthly, it will also encourage technological advancements. See, to qualify for incentives, companies need to enhance their production capabilities, right? So, this often involves adopting advanced technologies and practices. And finally, it will also help in attracting the foreign investment. And these are all the significances of PLI scheme. See, in this discussion, we saw about PLI scheme, how incentives are given to various sectors and the sectors for which the government has announced the incentives and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the significance of PLI scheme. Now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this article from the text and context page. This article is about the benchmark rates used by the banks. On May 12, RBI has issued an advisory to banks and other RBI regulated entities. The advisory is to take steps to ensure complete transition away from LIBOR from July 1, 2023. See, RBI advised banks and other financial institutions not to do any financial deals using LIBOR. So, what is this LIBOR? And why RBI has advised to move away from LIBOR? This is what we are going to learn in this discussion. Now, first let us take LIBOR. LIBOR is expanded as London Interbank Offered Rate. It is a global benchmark interest rate that is generally submitted by leading UK banks. It is used by major global banks to lend to one another in international interbank market for short term. So it is basically an interest rate used by international banks for lending one another for short term loans. Apart from this, LIBOR is also used as a benchmark rate to settle trades in futures, options, swaps and other derivative financial instruments in over-the-counter market and on stock exchanges globally. Here, over-the-counter market is nothing but a decentralized market in which market participants trade the stocks, commodities, currencies or other instruments. Here, the trade happens directly between each other and they do not rely on a central exchange or broker. And this is what is called as over-the-counter market. Now, coming back to LIBOR, see, apart from lending and trade settlements, consumer lending products, including credit cards and student loans, they also use the LIBOR as a benchmark rate. Now, what is the problem with this LIBOR? In 2012, it came to light that many global banks had plotted to manipulate the LIBOR. As I said earlier, LIBOR is submitted by leading UK banks. See, what they did was, the banks took the request of the traders and submitted artificially low LIBOR rates. The intention behind the mall practice was to increase the profits of the traders who were holding positions in the LIBOR-based financial securities. And because of this, the confidence about LIBOR among the market participants has faded. Apart from this, LIBOR also played a considerable role in escalating the 2008 financial crisis. So because of these problems, many central banks and regulatory authorities decided to move away from LIBOR. Now coming to India specific information. In July 2021, RBI advised banks to stop entering into LIBOR-linked contracts by December 31, 2021. 
major banks like SBI, ICICI Bank soon announced a transition to new benchmark rates. However, many of the remaining banks did not take ample steps to move away from LIBOR. And this is why on May 12, RBI has asked the banks and other regulated entities to ensure a complete transition away from LIBOR from July 1, 2023. See, if we want to move away from LIBOR, we should have an alternative, right? So, what is that alternative? See, RBI has offered some options like SOFR, Secured Overnight Financing Rate and MMIFOR which is expanded as Modified Mumbai Interbank Forward Outright Rate. See, this SOFR is linked to US Treasury market transactions. It is considered to be a more accurate and more secure pricing benchmark. This SOFR is based on the actual market activity and it does not depend on a few leading banks to set the rates. See, RBI has advised SOFR because the possibilities for manipulation are very less when compared with LIBOR. This is because LIBOR is dependent on the leading global banks but SOFR is dependent on the actual market activity. Now that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about LIBOR. What is it? And what is the problem with LIBOR? The alternatives for LIBOR and the RBI's advice. Now with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now this news article here talks about the recent violent clashes between the different ethnic groups in Manipur. See there are totally 16 districts in Manipur and the state is divided into valley and hill districts. The Impal Valley lies at the center of the state and it is surrounded by hills. The valley accounts for 10% of the Manipur's landmass and this valley is dominated by non-tribal Meiti community. The people belonging to this community account for over 64% of the state's population and they yield 40 out of 60 MLAs of the state. Meanwhile, the hills that account for 90% of the geographical area of the state are inhabited by about 35% of recognized tribes. But they are represented by only 20 MLAs in the state legislative assembly. See, the majority of the Maitis are Hindus, followed by Muslims. But the 33 recognized tribes who are broadly categorized as Naga tribes and Kuki tribes, they are mainly Christians. Know that more than 30 communities have been listed as scheduled tribes in Manipur and they all broadly belong to either Kuki community or Naga ethnic groups. No such recognition has been granted to Meiti community who live in the plains. Now this is the point of contention between these groups. See, despite adequate representation, since the year 2012, there has been constant demand led by Scheduled Tribes Demand Committee of Manipur for granting Scheduled Tribe status to the Métis community. In pursuit of this, the Métis Tribe Union recently filed a petition before the Manipur High Court to extend the ST status to the Métis community also. The petition argued that Métis community was once recognized as a tribe before the merger of princely state of Manipur with the Union of India in 1949. So the petition said that Métis community lost its identity as a tribe after the merger. The petition further argued that the community has been victimized without any constitutional protection and they have been gradually marginalized in their own ancestral land. The petition also states that their population has reduced from 59% of the total population of Manipur in 1951 to 44% as per the 2011 census data. So the petitioners demanded to extend the ST status to Meiti community also. This is to preserve the community and save their ancestral land, tradition, culture and language. In response to this petition, Manipur High Court on April 19, 2023 asked the Manipur government to submit a 10-year-old recommendation to the Union Tribal Affairs Ministry for the inclusion of Meiti community in the ST list. In other words, the court has directed the government to consider the inclusion of Meiti community in the tribe list of Manipur. 
on the other hand the demand for st status for the meiti community has been opposed by the other tribal groups of the state see other tribal groups they argue that meiti community already is more advanced than other tribal groups academically and in other aspects also they already have a demographic as well as a political advantage they believe that if st status is granted maitis will be allowed to acquire land in the hills also and this would ultimately result in the loss of employment opportunities and it would push the tribal people out of the hills so following the april 19th directives of manipur high court the all tribal students union of manipur called for a tribal solidarity march The march was organized in protest against the demand for inclusion of Meiti community in the ST category. However, violent clashes broke out at various places during the march. The situation in Manipur turned extreme. So Indian army and other central police forces were deployed. The Manipur government also authorized all district magistrates to issue shoot at sight orders in extreme cases in order to control the situation. See Supreme Court has regarded the Manipur crisis as a humanitarian problem and it noted that it is the president who has the power to designate a community as a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe and not the high court. Currently the center is working to restore peace in Manipur and the union home minister also said that the order passed by the Manipur high court will be studied and discussed with all stakeholders and appropriate decisions will be taken after consultation. and this is regarding the article given here see in this discussion we saw why violent clashes broke out in manipur and what are all the reasons behind it take note of all of the points as a upsc aspirant you should be knowing about the recent events happening in india right and that's why i took this article for discussion today now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion Now look at this article this news article speaks about the partnership between IIT Madras and Israeli government to ensure water security in India see India Israel water center will be established within the campus of IIT Madras and this new center will aid in the Amrit mission of Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs now in this regard we'll see about Amrit mission and Amrut 2.0 First of all let us see about the Amrut mission. See Amrut mission was launched on 25th June 2015. Amrut stands for Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation. See the main objective of this mission is to provide basic services to households and basic amenities in cities. Now you may have a question here. Does this scheme covers all cities in India? The answer is a big no. This scheme covers 500 cities and it has certain conditions for the selection too. See the categories of cities selected under Amrut includes cities and towns with population over 1 lakh and notified as municipalities as per the 2011 census. And it includes all capital cities, towns of states and union territories not covered in the first criteria. It also includes cities and towns classified as heritage cities under Hriday scheme. It also includes 13 cities and towns on the bank of important rivers with population above 75000 and less than 1 lakh. Finally it also includes 10 cities from hill states, islands and tourist destinations. See the components of Amrut includes capacity building, reform implementation, water supply, sewerage septage management storm water drainage non motorized urban transport and development of green spaces and parks this is about the basics of amrut mission next we'll see about the outcomes of the amrut mission under the scheme 4932 projects worth of 37926 crore have been completed know that 134 lakh water tap connections and 1 or 2 lakh sewer connections have been provided under this scheme see this amrut mission was subsumed under amrut 2.0 now we'll see what is amrut 2.0 amrut 2.0 was launched on 1st october 2021 the duration of this scheme is 5 years and the total outlay for amrut 2.0 is 2 lakh 99000 crore 
the main aim of the amrit 2.0 is to provide universal water connection through functional water taps to all households in 500 cities covered under the amrit mission see it will also promote circular economy of water see circular economy is nothing but the concept of recycling or reusing the available resources to minimize the wastage now coming to the important components of amrit 2.0 First of all there is this payjal sarvekshan see payjal sarvekshan will promote competitiveness among cities for benchmarking the urban water services next the amrit 2.0 emphasizes on community participation it emphasizes on community participation with special focus on women self help groups and this is the second component Thirdly when it comes to funding Amrit 2.0 provides outcome based funding and finally the scheme relies on evidence based evaluation of the outcomes using online monitoring platform and these are all the important components of Amrit 2.0 first one is payjal sarvekshan second one is community participation with special focus on self help groups third one is outcome based funding and the final one is evidence based evaluation Now that's all about this discussion in this discussion we saw about amrit mission its components outcomes amrit 2.0 and its components now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion today we have five prelims questions i will solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you now let us take this first question with reference to el nino consider the following statements statement 1 it is a climatic phenomenon that describes the unusual large scale warming of surface waters in the eastern indian ocean see this statement is incorrect we all know that el nino is a climatic pattern but the unusual large scale warming of surface temperature is in central and eastern equatorial pacific ocean so it is not associated with the indian ocean the second statement says that el nino event is associated with good rainfall during the monsoon season in india see this statement is also incorrect due to el nino the warming in the pacific ocean causes changes in the atmospheric patterns this leads to weakening of the monsoon circulation over the indian subcontinent as a result the indian monsoon tends to be weaker and less reliable during the el nino years Now the third statement says that it does not have a role in the global temperature rise. The statement is also incorrect. El Nino is one of the main factors of the global temperature rise. In our discussion about the WMO's update also we saw the same factor only. Now the question here asks us to find the incorrect statements. So the correct answer is option D 1 2 and 3. Now moving on to the second question. Which of the following are the sectors under the protection linked incentive scheme mobile manufacturing drone technology white goods textiles telecom see from our discussion itself we know that all of these sectors comes under pli scheme so the correct answer is option d 1 2 3 4 and 5 now moving on to the third question The question says that the term secured overnight financing rate sometimes in news is related to which of the following Option A says that it is the rate at which the RBI lends to the scheduled commercial banks to meet their overnight financial requirements Option B says that it is a benchmark interest rate submitted by the leading banks of the United Kingdom and it is used to settle trades on stock exchanges globally Option C it says that It is a secured interest rate that is related to US Treasury market transactions and it was established as an alternative to London Interbank offered rate. An option D, it says that it is the rate at which the International Monetary Fund provides short term loan for its members to address the immediate financial stress. See, from our discussion itself we know that SOFR is used as an alternative to LIBOR. from this information itself we know that the correct answer is option c now moving on to the fourth question consider the following statements statement 1 the meiti community follows the sanamahism religion which is indigenous to the region statement 2 lai haroba is celebrated to please the traditional deities of sanamahism see before attempting the question 
will understand about the community first. See, Maitis are a group of people who speak Manipuri in the Manipur state. Manipuri is listed as an official language under Schedule 8 of the constitution. Know about this, okay? See, the Maitai people are divided into two clans. And the members of the same clan do not intermarry. An interesting aspect of the village's socio-economic organization in Maiti society is the Maroop system. It literally means friendship association. It is a type of cooperative saving and credit institution. Rice cultivation on irrigated fields is the basis for their economy. Inafi and Fanek are the Manipuri traditional dress for women in Manipur. Manipur men wear their traditional costume dhoti with a jacket. See, these are all some basic information about the Meiti community. They do not intermarry between their clans. There is an interesting socio-economic organization called Maroop system and it is a type of cooperative saving and credit institution and the basis of their economy is the rice cultivation. Now about their religious affairs. See, they are predominantly Vaishnavite Hindus, but even before the advent of Hinduism, they practiced their own religion known as Sanamahism religion. Lai Haroba is a festival celebrated to please Sanamahism. It is celebrated to honor the Silvan deities known as Umang Lai. Here, Umang Lai are the group of sacred grooves preserved for the local forest deities. So, regarding the question, both the statements are correct. So, the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now, moving on to the final question. See, aspirants, this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question carefully, think about it and post your answer in the comment section. See, aspirants, I have given here mains questions for your practice. So, if you are interested, write it and post your answer in the comment section. If you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. With this we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.